have questions, I think it's going to be best to hold them until the end and we'll take them and have a good interactive discussion at that point. Our first speaker, Dr. Anna Palis. She's uh, speaking about adult learning principles and generational learning. She's associate professor, Department of Ophthalmology, the Italian Hospital of Buenos Aires, Buenos Aires, Argentina. Dr. Palis, welcome, thank you. Good afternoon. The goals of this presentation will be to discuss how people learn with the objective of making our teaching more effective. I would first like you to reflect on some questions to see if any of these situations happen to you as students or at, as residents. They definitely <laughs> happened to me, so I'm going to share them with you. Lectures used to last for two hours uninterrupted. I spent long days standing by the teacher's side just watching. I never really knew why it was important to list the axillary arteries branches. No one ever checked how I measured intraocular pressure. Do any of these situations look familiar to you? Okay. So this is because adult learning principles were, were not applied uh, when designing uh, teaching. There are several theories that explain how people learn, and I like this model because it combines several of these theories. It's a, it's a constructivist model, and I'm going to explain it step by step. So the first thing that happens for people to learn is that they have, their existing knowledge has a conflict, or what is called dissonance. So because they have a question with a patient or a task to solve that they don't know how to do it, they will find this dissonance in their uh, cognition. So they will be able to reflect and observe and try to define their learning needs in order to solve this problem. And this will happen depending on the nature of the task, the resources they count with, the motivation of the student and the stage of development. How can we help them as teachers in this stage? We can help them explore their prior knowledge and experiences to solve the problem and help them identify their learning needs, help them try to decide what is necessary for them to solve. The second stage is one of elaboration and refinement. So once they have reflected and observed on what they need to solve, they will be doing some research or going to the book or discussing it with someone or completing some task that will help them uh, resolve their problem and develop a new concept. So from their existing knowledge, they will be able to develop something new. How can we help them as teachers in this stage? Ensuring them relevant experiences. And relevance is probably one of the most important aspects of adult learning these days because medicine is growing every day. It's expanding rapidly. So we cannot stick with the same content that we were teaching 10 years ago because our students don't have enough time to incorporate new knowledge, the, the new knowledge means, uh, that comes with medicine every year. So we have to be very selective and pick up very carefully what we are trying to teach to our students. How can we make our teaching more relevant? We can pick, for example, a problem-based approach where our students can see not only the theory, but they can also see how to apply the, uh, or how the theory is tied to the practice. We need to help them know the learning outcomes, what is exactly what we want them to learn. And then when we assess them, we have to select exams not only of the theory, but also on how the theory applies to practice. We have to examine them in clinical practice because that's important for us. We want them to learn the practice, not only the theory. And when I talk about relevance, you have to be, make sure that it's relevant for them, not it's relevant to you. You can be great cornea specialists and you may think that cornea dystrophies are very important but if your student has already decided that he wants to be a glaucoma surgeon, 
And he is not able to see how the cornea dystrophies are relevant to what he's going to be in the future. He won't be motivated to learn it. So make sure that it's relevant for them. We can say that relevance is the difference between what you want to teach or what you want to say and what they want to learn. The third step would be that of organization of knowledge. So students will try to organize the new knowledge into a model that works for them and that makes sense to them. How can we help them in this step? We can provide them with organizers that may help them uh, organize their knowledge easier. And we have to encourage reflect reflection. How can we make our teaching more reflective? Well, we have plenty of opportunities during clinical teaching and uh, during surgery to question our students, to ask them, how did you get to this conclusion? Why are you selecting this treatment instead of this other one? Why are you having this complication? In our department, we use what are called reflective journals. So every week, our students have to select two cases that they think that were interesting and from which they learned, and write a brief summary of what they learned in these two cases. I'm going to, to read you a brief example of how this looked like. So this student says, today during the corneal rotation, a patient came in with a recurrent corneal erosion. I wasn't sure if I had to indicate the usual therapy or if something else was necessary. So I asked Dr. F, who performed a micropuncture. I then found in an article that this generates adhesions between the epithelium and the stroma. So this student here is reflecting and realizing that he didn't know something and how he solved the problem. He, he went to ask someone and he found something in an article. So it's a lot of reflection that helps him realize what he doesn't know and how to solve the problem. <coughs> we help our students with a guideline on how to reflect, especially when they start reflection, it's difficult for them to um, make the proper questions to help them reflect better. So we provide them with a guideline. What happened here? What happened in this situation? How did you feel? What options did you have to solve this problem? Where did you go for help? What happened then? How was it solved? What did you learn from this experience? Feedback is probably one of the most crucial aspects of this process because this is where the student is able to compare how he solved the problem with what the teacher has to say. And uh, in fact, feedback has proven to be one of the most crucial uh, interventions that um, influence students' achievement. How should we deliver feedback? We have to be specific. We have to let students know what is it that they have to change. Not just to tell them you're doing great or you're doing bad, but telling them specifically what they need to improve. You have to make sure that you judge the action and not the person or the person's personality. It's okay to tell the student, you have arrived late to the last five sessions, instead of telling him, you are unreliable. Because probably the student, maybe he has a problem and that's why he arrived late. But to say someone, uh, you are unreliable, it will close his ears to anything else you have to say. So don't judge the person, but judge the, per the, the, the person's actions. Make sure to make it timely and ba try to balance the positive with negative comments. Everybody wants to hear positive comments of him or herself. So try to balance both. And finally comes the step of consolidation, where the student is ready to retest or, or um, try uh, these new concepts that he has learned. How can we help as teachers in this uh, step? We can provide them with opportunities to rehearse or to apply knowledge, and we have to encourage reflection again. So this theory called experiential learning states that when you have a concrete experience, for example, a tear in the capsulorexis, and you are able to observe and reflect about this experience, in this case, the student is reflecting 
with the tutor. What happened here, is asking, why did you have this tear in the capsular rexis? I don't know, says the student. So see the tip of your forceps, what's going on here? It's pinching the capsule. So this student is being able to make a concept or to, to form a concept that the forceps should grab the flap gently touching the border, without touching the border. And so in a next surgery, she'll be able to try again this, and she will have a successful rexis. So the combination of the experience with the tutor's feedback and the student's reflection are probably the three best um, uh, uh, processes that stimulate learning. In this model, activity is not mentioned, but I included it because I think that it's very important uh, because it comes from the principle that to learn better, learners should actively participate in their learning. So how can we make our teaching more active? We can make our lectures interactive, asking students to participate, making questions. With sessions of small group teaching, with a flipped classroom, and Eduardo Mayorga will talk about this in a few minutes, with reflective portfolios like the one I showed you a minutes ago, some minutes ago, and with models and simulators. So in summary, beyond the millions of learning theories that explain adult learning, the tips I'd like you to remember to take home are, are that um, teaching has to be active, it has to be reflective, it has to include reflection, it has to be relevant, and it needs to include feedback from you, the teachers. Thank you. Excellent points. Thank you so much for sharing that. The next talk is uh, by Ed Eduardo Mayorga. He's the honorary head of the eye department at the Italian hospital in Buenos Aires, Argentina. He has a very intriguing title, The Flipped Classroom. Let's see what he's going to tell us. So, <clears throat> good afternoon. I'm shivering, not sure because of it's cold or I'm nervous. Um, so my topic now is the flipped classroom. My goal is to present you with the definition, the background, and the strategies to implement this way of teaching. And the, my objectives are that by the end of this session, we should be able to explain the concept of flipped classroom, discuss its pros and cons, apply a stepway approach to implement it, identify existing resources to build it, and identify free or low-cost software that will help you develop this kind of teaching intervention. I will divide my talk in three parts, the what, the why, and the how. So let's start with the what. Usually, what's called the traditional classroom is the teacher is here giving the lectures, the learners are sitting down, and then they're giving homework to do at home alone. You may say, OK, but we don't give homework to our residents and our fellows. Well, you really do. You give them the lecture and then you expect them to go alone and apply what they've learned there. So the flipped classroom, what we do is we send the learners to go and get the knowledge on their own, reading a book, watching a, a, a recorded lecture, whatever. And then they come to classroom with us, but then we don't give lectures there, we just help them apply what they have learned. So this would be the definition. What about the why? Usually, when you're giving a lecture to several persons, not everybody has the same level of knowledge. Usually, when you give talks to residents, you have first-year residents, second-year residents, third-year residents. Some residents 
I'll go into this in a moment. The other reason is efficiency. And the third reason for implementing this is being there with your learners at the moment of need. So, as I said before, you have different groups of less citizens with different previous knowledge. So you will be giving a lecture that you think everybody is understanding and following it, but you already have these kind of faces. Some of them are falling back. They can't follow you. In other cases, you, live in, you will identify these kind of persons. They already know it. They are listening to this lecture for the third time. This is the third year, and they are answering their emails. So the next thing why we need this is for efficiency. Usually, we, have, we prepare our lecture once, and year after year, we keep on giving this lecture using a lot of our time, the same lecture, probably. So the idea is you do this once, you record it, and then you send your residents to listen to it. You don't have to use your time to do this every time the same way. And the last one, and probably one of the most important, is that you are present at the moment they will need you most. Why is this? If you look at the Bloom's taxonomy for educational objectives, you will see that as the level of the objective goes up, the expertise you need to acquire or to reach these objectives is greater. And what are we usually doing? We are being with our residents at the lower level when they need to get the lower level objectives, the memorizing, understanding. And we leave them alone when they need to apply this, to analyze what they've learned. So the idea under the flipped classroom is that we, as teachers, move ourselves from the easier part, the one they can do alone, to the part they will need us most. So let's see now the hows. Regarding preparing the material while they will get the lecture, you have two options. You either do it yourself, you prepare the lecture, you record it, you set it online, you just send them to them, or you look for material that is already available on the web and you send them there. The choice is yours. What are the steps you should follow? The, fo the following steps are needed for almost every teaching intervention. You need to define the objectives, the ha define how you will assess them, prepare the lecture, narrate and public the lecture in this case, prepare the activities and run the class. Defining objectives is always the first step in every teaching intervention. You have to clearly define what you want your learners to achieve. Suppose you've be given the, 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 the core to develop a class on topography and refractive surgery. So you decide that your objective for this lecture is that your, your residents will be able to identify risk factors for corneal ectasia in candidates for refractive surgery. That's your objective. Next step is define the assessment. Usually assessment is left for the last. You maybe define the objectives of not, you prepare your lectures, and then you define how to assess them. No, the way to go is to define how you're going to assess them, because based on the objectives and how you're going to assess them is how you will prepare the lecture. In this case, in this example, we decided we would pre present them with topography prints so that they are able to define if they're normal or not, we would present them complete clinical cases to ask them if the candidates are good for surgery or not, and if, in case they are, what techniques should be prepared, and then present them with borderline cases and ask them what other uh, studies would they need to make a decision. So once we have that, then we go and prepare the lecture. As I said before, you can do it yourself, but you can also go and look in the web, and there are many places you will probably find lectures as good or even better than the ones you will be able to prepare, and this will also save you a lot of time. If you decide to do it, you can record it and publish it. Today, recording lecture is made very easy. 
with a PowerPoint uh, software where you can record slide by slide. If you mess it up, you can go back to any slide and change it. If you prepared a lecture one year ago and you want to add or subtract something, it's easy to do. And the other way is using screencast uh, software. One of the um, uh, advantages of using this screencast software, specifically Screencast-O-Matic, that it's very low cost and that it allows you to store this recording on the web. You can also upload your recordings to YouTube when you do it with PowerPoint. But as I said before, when you upload them to YouTube, you, you can't add, for example, a menu to them. So it could be a one-hour lecture, and once they've watched it once and they want to go back to one part of another, it's very difficult to do it. Instead, in using this other kind of software, you can develop uh, a menus where residents can easily jump from one part to the other or review a specific part they need. In this case, those residents that are new to the topic will probably watch this lecture once or twice and review some of the topics, and probably those third-year residents that have gone, got this for the third time would just go fast, fast forward through all the lecture. The next step is to prepare the activities. In the activities, usually one should try, as we said before, we would present them with uh, uh, some information to make decisions. But knowledge questions can also be needed. Why? Because if you find out they are making the wrong decisions, you have to know if it's because of the lack of knowledge, basic knowledge on the topic, or just because they are doing bad choices. But then you go into application questions. For example, ask them this kind of topography, how high is the risk for this patient to get an ectasia? Or you give them some information and you ask them that based on this information, they answer some questions. In this case, what will be the thickness of the residual stroma? in case you do a LASIK procedure or a PRK. When, it's, when it comes to, to developing this kind of cases, you can also develop them yourself, or you can look for case scenarios also on the web and work on those. Finally, you run the classroom. In the classroom, you want it to be interactive because you will be presenting this and asking them, what would you do the problem with this is that once one answered, you'll never know if the rest knew or not. So here is where some technology comes handy and allows you to get the answers from all without knowing who answers what. Uh, clickers uh, were once used, but now there are more um, efficient software that just run on the phones of your learners, that uh, the software is free, and that has the possibility, this is the, the software I, I recommend, so Socrative it's called, it allows you to ask multiple choice questions and know which resident answered what, and also uh, uh, ask open-ended questions and get the individual answers without the rest of the residents knowing who answered what but you will know. So, finally, the pros of the flipped classroom is that you send your residents to the easy part, getting the knowledge, and you will be present there in the difficult part, supervising how they apply it. You will be able to take them to a higher level of thinking. This is usually very interactive, and usually residents enjoy this, and you will have less uh, waste of time because repeating your same lecture every year is really a waste of time. What are the cons? Some say that residents may not look at narrative lectures in advance. The thing is that if you tell them, well, every time you come, this is an assessment and we will be assessing you, then they probably will be complying with this. So, summarizing. The flipped classroom has a lot of advantages over the way we traditionally give lectures. 
We are there present where they need us most. That is when applying the knowledge that is the most difficult thing to do. And you have uh, these, all these steps you should follow, probably in this order, to make this uh, flipped classroom a successful teaching intervention. Thank you. Again, lots of great ideas there, and we'll have a chance to discuss these uh, during the discussion period. Our next speaker is Dr. Richard Abbott. He's going to uh, talk to us about using clinical practice guidelines and clinical outcomes data to formulate content for uh, ophthalmic educational programs. He's professor of ophthalmology, University of California, San Francisco, and secretary for Global Alliances and past president, American Academy of Ophthalmology, Dr. Abbott. I can use this. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here uh, back at KCASH. My first visit here was uh, back in 1989, and it's wonderful to be back. Uh, we're going to talk about the future of building a curriculum for uh, educational programs, but the future is really uh, here uh, right now. And I'd like to uh, congratulate Aziz on a wonderful uh, interactive program. Here we are at Abu Dhabi at the WOC, and uh, just this past year in Hong Kong when we uh, had lunch together. So the issue is, uh, do we as physicians use evidence to help guide our clinical practice uh, decisions? And the evidence from the Institute of Medicine shows that evidence is really only used about 50% of the time when we're taking care of patients. And that, believe it or not, there's actually a 12-year lag for adoption of results from randomized clinical trials. It's really uh, astonishing data. So what is evidence-based medicine? Well, it's the use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients but it's not only the evidence that you use, it's also your clinical expertise as well as the patient's values. So it's the combination of these three that make up uh, evidence-based medicine, and it's not cookbook medicine. When you have an, so much information coming at us, a clinical practice guideline, if it's well-developed and up-to-date, is really uh, very helpful to us because it uh, creates either a consensus opinion by recognized experts um, or results from a randomized clinical trial that uh, is reported in the peer-reviewed literature and gives us a basis for what we do in treating our patients. The goal of the guideline really should ultimately uh, result in an improved uh, measurable outcome improved intraocular pressure, 2020 vision, whatever that outcome is. But the truth is, we really do need a lot more evidence. And the other question is, are the clinical guideline recommendations really accurate? Because we really have been lacking the outcomes data that we need. In addition, RCTs are expensive, and they're really limited to relatively small number of diseases and conditions and are very expensive and time consuming. And because of this high cost and difficulty associated with performing clinical trials, um, most of the things we teach really is not evidence-based and in fact it's eminence-based. It's really what our teachers teach us 
Some of it may be based on some evidence, some of it may be based more on uh, clinical uh, opinions. So I think now we, we do have a terrific opportunity in our profession in ophthalmology to capture real data on what we do in our practice and to analyze the outcomes data and to educate from it. So the shift from paper medical records to electronic uh, records help us do this. The Academy launched in 2014 the IRIS registry. This is the improved performance and outcomes in ophthalmology, linking uh, diseases, surgery with outcomes over time, and using uh, EHR systems to integrate this data. The registry offers real-world clinical data for millions of patients, and it gives us the opportunity to be used for comparative effective research, stratification of risk in various diseases, and outcomes of disease and conditions after treatment. Now look at these statistics, and these are just a few weeks old. Over 18,000 physicians in the U.S. are contributing data to the registry, and there are now 22, uh, 222 million patients representing 51.81 million individual patients. I mean, this is truly what's called big data. And it's the largest clinical registry in all of medicine, not only in ophthalmology, in the world. So how do you harness this information, all this data? And this is the challenge that we now are faced with. So this data, if you can harness it, will shorten the timeline between science and the adoption of best practices through education. It can assist us in clinical decision making. It can supplement the practitioner's knowledge and clinical expertise by adding outcomes data to expand the clinician's ability to process all of this uh, data. Just yesterday, it was announced that the Research to Prevent Blindness, RPB, and the American Academy had awarded grants for big data research to advance patient care. And if you look at what, what they did, one is to examine what might be behind the increase in myopia in children, to look at new factors that can influence how these vision problems progress. We're talking about millions of patients in this database. Another is to look at pediatric uveitis, a relatively rare disease, and look at how we best treat these patients, again, with a large volume of data. A third is to look at using a medicine for diabetes, metformin, to reduce the incidence or slow down the progression of age-related macular degeneration with the premise that the anti-inflammatory effects of the metformin may be beneficial in preventing or slowing down the ARMD. And the fourth grant was looking at glaucoma tubes or shunts versus trabeculectomy. There was a clinical trial in this area, but this would allow us to look at uh, more uh, insight into the best treatment. So the education opportunities from this data are huge. What we're looking for is to identify gaps in clinical knowledge and decision-making among our clinicians, and then use this, use these gaps to form educational programs and thereby improve clinical decision-making. If additional gaps can be identified, then this information can be disseminated in an educational course or symposium or in a published uh, communication, and improved safety and clinical outcomes can be achieved. And once we have this, then we can complete the loop. So you can look at subsequent outcomes data and see if this knowledge gap has been reduced. 
So it's a nice way to, to attack it, where they identify where the gap is, and then close the loop by looking at data, later data, as um, new recommendations are incorporated. So how will we choose the topics to teach or review when planning future CME courses? Well, the registry data and subsequent studies will help us identify topics. So when you're planning a meeting here at KCASH, and if you have this data, you can focus the topics based on where the need is most likely. Maybe it's managing astigmatism at the time of cataract surgery. What is the most effective way to do this? Or prophylaxis options to prevent endophthalmitis. Or maybe the management of orbital lymphomas. Or white retinal dot syndrome or management of cataract surgery and lens implants in patients with pseudoexfoliation glaucoma. So in conclusion, the current and future goals for electronic health record technology really points us to improving how we develop the content for clinical education and make this more evidence-based looking at where the gaps are and then focusing our CME on these gaps. And then once you identify the gaps, to then complete the loop and see if indeed the outcomes are improving. So we're hoping for a system capable of producing both high quality evidence to support recommendations and thera therapeutic decisions to improve quality of care for our patients, reduce the likelihood of medical error, advance patient safety measures, and improve clinical education. The Academy is looking at international collaboration, and I think once we begin to get these studies uh, done in the U.S., we hope to have this uh, available in the future around the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, and I think we're going to see a lot of good discussion about that particular topic when we get to our discussion at the end. It raises a lot of interesting questions. Um, Dr. Anna, come back, please, and uh, tell us about medical professionalism in the 21st century, how are we doing and how can we improve it? So the um, goals for this presentation will be to discuss what to teach about medical professionalism, what are the challenges for medical professionalism in this last years, and how we can foster professionalism in our residents. There are several organizations around the world that have tried to define what are the most important characteristics that professionalism has to include. This is the one that the American Board of Internal Medicine um, designed, and uh, it's the one on, uh, that the ACGME is based on. So the main domains of professionalism that they have defined are altruism, accountability to patients, society, and profession, excellence, duty, which is commitment to service, honor and integrity, and respect for others. This author, Aleraki, that is from this country, and Chandra Tilake, they took this list to uh, 32 medical experts uh, in several countries in the Middle East, and they decided that by consensus that uh, another uh, domain that would be interesting to have in this list for this context is professional autonomy of physicians. They validated the first six, but they added this last uh, domain for the Arab countries. Because it is true that professionalism is culture sensitive. 
some aspects of professionalism that are acceptable in some countries are not in others. For example, in my country, we greet patients with a kiss. And this would not be acceptable in Japan, for example. So there is no universal, um, th there is not a universal list of competencies regarding professionalism that it's applicable to everywhere in the world. So this author, Al Iraqi, who is from the University of Daman and uh, Zagazig University in Egypt, he conducted a Delphi study with 17 experts in different universities in Egypt, Oman, Saudi Arabia, and Sudan, and they described the basic attributes of medical professionalism in the Arabian context. And they framed it as what they called the four gates model of medical professionalism. Are you aware of this model? Are you using this model? No? Okay. So the first gate that they describe would be dealing with self. And this includes being self-aware, recognizing your own potentials and limitations, and self-management of time and of life, and having a balance between the personal and professional roles. The second task would be dealing, uh, sorry, the second uh, gate would be dealing with a task. And this includes excellence, both in clinical practice, teaching and research, and a commitment to professional development, and also having a reflective practice. The third gate would be dealing with others. And this includes respe having respect for patients, colleagues, supervisors, and subordinates, and keeping professional confidentiality. And the fourth gate, and this is why it's so relevant uh, according to this author, is dealing with God. And this includes self-accountability for your own behaviors in absence of human monitoring, and we'll be able to discuss this later in the, in the questions uh, uh, space, and self-motivation, which means expecting rewards from God and not from people. So in this model, you can see that starting with yourself, and moving up to the overarching dealing with God, that this is why these authors think that this is a more applicable um, model in this country than, or, in, or in, in the Arab countries than importing a model from the West. What are the challenges that we have today with uh, professionalism? And how are we doing? Not very well, as you can imagine. There is plenty of literature that shows that patients complain about physicians and professional behaviors and tend to sue more when they consider that the, professional, that the physician has not been professional enough. There are in, uh, increasing public concerns that physicians are impersonal, self-serving, and dishonest, that physicians don't tend to update or per, uh, only pursue their self-interest, and that probably commercialism and the corporate transformation of medicine are those uh, aspects that have been more deleterious to medical professionalism. Because in some systems, the only thing that is important is the doctor that brings more money into the system and not the one that is professional with patients. In the educational aspect, probably the aspect that um, is more or the, or that, that provokes more erosion to medical professionalism is what is called the hidden curriculum. The hidden curriculum is what our students see us doing and not what we say necessarily. The declared or the open curriculum is what we tell our students that they, sh they should be doing. And the hidden curriculum is what our students really see us doing. So for example, if we tell our students that we have to be punctual with, your, with our patients, but they see us arriving late every day, that is the aspect that they are going to imitate, not what we are telling them, but what we are doing. What are the signs and symptoms of unprofessional behaviors? And uh, the, um, again, the Association 
for uh, the American Board for Internal Medicine has described or has categorized them in this list, abuse of power, arrogance, greed, misrepresentation, impairment, lack of conscientiousness, and conflicts of interest. But is professionalism all or none? Are we professional every time or we are not professional at all? Well, no and yes. We all drift in and out our professional behaviors every day. It's more difficult to be professional when you are, for example, hungry or you, are, you have some personal problems or you're being late to surgery or you have to catch a plane or you're seeing your 50th patient in the day instead of your first one, or the patient is uncooperative or is always unhappy, or uh, some other personal problems that you may have. But the important thing with this is that we have to recognize when we, uh, when, when we behavior unprofessionally. And especially if we have residents working with us and our residents are watching us behave, if we make a mistake, we have to recognize it and tell a resident, this is not acceptable. I have to improve in this aspect. How can we foster professionalism in our residents? And the traditional way of doing it, and probably the most effective one, is through role modeling. The problem with role modeling is that you transmit the good, but also the bad and the ugly. Your residents, as I said, are looking for you and are looking at you, so you will be transmitting the good examples, but also the bad and the ugly. So this author has listed 12 tips for teaching medical professionalism. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to talk about all of them, but I'm going to point out some that I think that are most important and more, most relevant to this context. So outline the cognitive base. First, you have to decide, and I think that you have because I've, I've seen it in your website, to agree on what defines your institution. What's important to KCash? What's your vision? What is your scope of services? What are your priorities and your future plans? And according to this, decide what will be taught and, and what is expected of your faculty, of your residents, of anybody working for KCash. Promote a professional environment, not only in your open curriculum, but also in your hidden curriculum. Again, so everybody tries to strive to behave professionally. And encourage that your students and your residents are able to disclose or to observe openly when they observe a lapse in professionalism. Foster role modeling. Communicate the criteria for excellence, both in education and also in clinical practice. Again, so everybody gets to know what's acceptable and what is not. Reward exemplary models. When we receive a letter of a, a thank you letter from a patient, for example, or um, a congratulations letter from one of our patients to a doctor, we let all the staff and all the faculty and all the residents know that this doctor received this congratulations letter because he performed or he behaved this way. So everybody has a clear idea of what um, uh, is acceptable or not. Or not. Label and categorize and professional behaviors again so everybody has an idea of this and communicate the policies and procedures for reporting and remediation. Provide a learning opportunity that's appropriate to the level of learners. You can use vignettes. I'm going to show you a couple of examples in a, in a minute. They, they can be written. You can use role play. You can use videos that you can get in the internet or you can record them yourselves. You can use clips from popular medical drama, like Dr. House is great for getting examples of unprofessional conduct, scraps, etc. And reflective uh, journals like the one I showed you in my uh, previous presentation. This article, Residency Education Professionalism Vignettes, was published in ophthalmology some years ago. And they list, the authors list 10 vignettes that you can use to discuss with your resident what is acceptable or not regarding professionalism. I go, I'm going to read you a couple of examples. 
A drug company wishes to pay the ophthalmologist and a spouse or guest to attend a dinner lecture on the company's product. Is this acceptable? Is it not? If it is, why? If it's not, why not? Another vignette. An ophthalmologist sees a patient who experiences a complication after cataract extraction that requires a vitrectomy. The patient was not consented for this possibility, and the ophthalmologist adds this information to the original cataract surgery consent after the event. Is this correct to do? Is this acceptable here? It's not. If it is, why it is? If it's not, why it's not? Are there exceptions to this conduct or not? And finally, consider the digital aspects of professionalism, or what is called e-professionalism. The first one, maintain the patient confidentiality. It's not okay to get selfies with your patients and post them in Facebook. Even if your patient consents, you'll need to have a written consent of that because you don't know in the future if the patient sees the, his picture there, if he will be that happy to share this with everybody in the world. Separate your personal and your professional content. If you're traveling abroad and you're having a party with your friends and you post this on the social media, be careful because everybody is going to be able to see this at home. And also maintain your appropriate boundaries uh, with the, of the patient-physician relationship. I don't accept my patients as friends in Facebook, for example, because my personal life is my personal life and my professional life is my professional life. I don't want my patients seeing that I, I don't know, I went to a party for my mother's birthday. I, they, they, they don't have to see that. So keep that separate. How do we evaluate professionalism? Uh, one of the recommended ways to do it is with 360 degree evaluations, where the resident is evaluated not only by the faculty, but also by their peers, co-workers, patients, and self. The ICO, uh, we, we published at the beginning of this year, a 360 degree assessment tool that was internationally validated. And um, also this author, Alan Sari, with uh, different universities in Bahrain, they validated uh, an assessment tool, a 360 degree assessment tool they use in Canada. So if you'd like to take a look at this reference, maybe it's uh, relevant for you as well. So in conclusion, professionalism is important because it defines our identity as physicians and it has to be taught and assessed in context. So pick a model that it's relevant to your context. It will be easier for you to implement a, con a, a model that is relevant to your context and to uh, improve professionalism if you select something that is relevant for you. And select supplementary strategies other than role modeling to teach and assess professionalism, like for example, structured reflection with feedback or the vignettes or the resources that I have already shown you. So, that's all, and thank you very much for your attention. Again, I look forward to the discussion on this topic because it's so important. We're going to turn to a local talent now for our continuing discussion. Dr. Suleiman al Suleiman will discuss ophthalmology residency here in Saudi Arabia. He's consultant ophthalmologist and a member of the Vitro Retinal Division at King Khalid Eye Specialist Hospital. Suleiman.
podien hodí. Okay, uh, there seems to be a problem loading that talk, so we'll go on to the next talk, and that's going to be how do we, fe fellows and residents, see it. And that's from Abdul Rahman Al Darab, a fellow in the Glaucoma Division at King Khalid Eye Specialist Hospital. Good afternoon, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Abdelhan Darab, uh, the chief fellow and a previous uh, chief resident. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the uh, positives and uh, negatives um, of the residency and uh, fellowship programs and the new additions and new improvements in these programs. Uh, but before that, I would like to uh, thank the residency and the fellowship uh, office, uh, especially Dr. Sami Shahwan. Um, for his great effort in improving these uh, programs because I've worked with him during the residency and uh, I'm still working with him during the fellowship uh, and uh, I know the difficulties he faced and he's still facing to add these uh, improvements. Uh, my talk is uh, split in two halves uh, for the residency and for the uh, fellowship. Um, we mainly have uh, many programs in the kingdom and uh, more than one program in Riyadh, but uh, I will concentrate on uh, Kekish uh, residency program. Uh, 
Uh, it's four years of training, uh, two years for the uh, juniors and two for seniors. And as in any uh, residency program, the resident is uh, required to cover clinics, on calls, um, uh, and to fill the surgical requirements. Actually, you didn't miss uh, something valuable till now. So, uh, however, are things completely uh, smooth? Um, things uh, may have been changed in the last two years after Dr. Sami Shawan became the um, uh, program director. So, for this reason, um, I, uh, I discussed this issue with the current Kekish uh, chief resident. Although many issues um, uh, have been improved or even resolved, uh, they are still complaining of the same issues we used to complain from mainly the teaching, emergency, and the uh, surgical exposure. For the teaching issue, Dr. Sami Shahwan tried to improve this uh, issue as much as um, uh, he can. Previously, like four or more for, uh, years back, they, they had only um, uh, one morning uh, CTR session, and it was held at the University, King Street University, on Tuesday morning. Uh, however, uh, currently, starting from uh, 2017, Dr. Sam Shahwan uh, added two more uh, CTRs. Uh, the, the first one is the uh, retina imaging conference, alternating with the emergency CTR and comprehensive CTR, and uh, this is on uh, Monday morning. Uh, the second new addition is the KCASH CTR, which is the subspecialty, which is almost the same as the uh, KSU CTR, but uh, by KCASH uh, staff. Uh, this is on Wednesday uh, morning. And the, these three, all, all of them are interactive uh, lectures, not uh, just traditional lectures. On Tuesday uh, uh, afternoon session, the PM session, it's the same long, uh, for, for a long time now. It's uh, excellent for the residents. Uh, the first hour is about subspeciality lecture. The second hour um, is for all uh, medical staff, not on, uh, only for the residents, uh, the grand rounds. The third and fourth hour is about weekly quiz and case presentations. Uh, these are for the residents. Some of the residents are complaining of somehow low uh, teaching during the clinics. Is it because of uh, busy clinics? I believe that the resident should read and ask during the clinic. He should not wait uh, for the consultant uh, just to uh, do a, a teaching uh, session uh, during the uh, middle of the um, clinic. Uh, these are some of the tables uh, of the CTRs. This is the Kekish uh, subspeciality CTR. This is in 2019. Um, um, we can see the anterior segment, oculoplastic, glaucoma, retina, and pediatric. And uh, this, as I mentioned, on Wednesday morning. Every mo Wednesday morning, they will have a subspeciality uh, lecture. Uh, this is the comprehensive uh, CTR. Um, on Monday, as I said, it's, it will be alternating with the uh, retina imaging conference on Monday morning. This is the retina imaging uh, conference. Uh, this is the uh, table of the academic activity, which is on Tuesday uh, afternoon. Uh, this is on 2019. As I mentioned, the first hour will be for the subspeciality lecture, the second hour for the grand round for all medical staff, and the third and fourth hour is for the weekly quiz and case presentations for the residents. Here we can see um, uh, numbers uh, in the last couple of years. Everything is documented like the basic uh, science, science course, the review courses, CTRs, uh, quizzes, and um, uh, wet lab uh, sessions. Here we can see the residents' research in the last two years, and we can see the jump between the black and blue bars. The black bar is 2016. The Blue bar is the 2017, and we can see that the numbers uh, doubled or even uh, tripled for Kekish residents as well as for the uh, joint uh, residents. The second issue is the uh, emergency. Uh, as we know that the number of patients are increasing every year because the staff is increasing as well. 
we do not have still no fixed triage system in the emergency. Uh, and as you know, um, uh, as Kekish is a specialist center, many patients will be uh, referred to um, the emergency, um, and this will increase the load um, on the uh, residents um, on call. Uh, I believe that the triage system uh, should be fixed um, in the emergency. Uh, as well, what's happening in, in any other um, hospital, even in general uh, hospitals. The third issue uh, uh, is the surgical exposure. Uh, again, Dr. Sami Shahwan tried to improve this issue as much as he can, and he added three main things. The first one is the wet lab, a, foot, uh, a fully wood, uh, equipped wet lab to improve the surgical skills of the residents and the uh, fellows. Uh, the second, um, I think, is the uh, India rotation, and this is not only uh, for Kekish residents. This is now for only two years uh, for the, uh, all of the residents in the kingdom, not only at Kekish. Currently, the senior residents um, uh, will have a one-month uh, rotation in India, and in this month, they will do more than 60 cataract uh, surgeries. Uh, the, th uh, the third issue is the, uh, the third thing is the comprehensive rotation. For this uh, rotation, it was um, um, applied in the last, uh, again, two, uh, two years, and uh, during the screening, um, uh, of patients, uh, Dr. Sam Shawan tried to, uh, to um, uh, collect straightforward cataract cases, and this was not uh, as it before. For um, uh, Kekesh has a policy uh, not to accept straightforward cataract cases. Uh, now, cataract, uh, straightforward cataract cases will be in the comprehensive rotation and the comprehensive clinic. Uh, this is for the juniors and for the seniors. Uh, two months for the juniors and one month for the seniors, and they will do um, an average of 10 to 20 uh, cataract surgeries uh, per month. Here we can see the um, uh, wet lab uh, courses in the, uh, 2019. I will just show you a sample, like the sclerofixated IOL course, and for us, the glaucoma fellows, we had the KDB, the Kahook dual blade in January 2018. Uh, what I observe, and, and with numbers, um, uh, the number of cataract surgeries done by Kekish um, residents is doubled or even tripled in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, however, what about the uh, other emergency um, or general surgical cases, like primary repair? If a patient is adult with open globe injury presented to the emergency, uh, the anterior segment uh, fellow will do the case. Um, and if the patient is a, a child, the pediatric fool will do the case. The resident will never do a primary repair. I discussed this issue with Dr. Sam Shawan this week, and he promised that this thing will be solved. And actually, I conduct him, it's already solved, that he will do, uh, he will apply a new schedule for the senior uh, residents, the second on-call, uh, to be involved with the operating team, uh, to participate with the anterior segment and uh, the pediatric team uh, to do the primary repair. The second issue is the lid laceration. If the patient is eligible to the hospital, the oculoplastic fellow will do the case, not the uh, resident. This issue is still uh, not solved. Uh, the third issue is the tregium and calasian. Uh, if the patient is eligible, I mean, if the patient had only tregium or only had uh, calasian, the patient will not be eligible, and this will decrease the number of uh, cases, uh, of these cases to the residents. The fourth issue, which is, uh, uh, I think it's a huge issue, the retinopathy of prematurity. Most of them, or all of them, are not eligible uh, to the hospital due to the uh, age and weight policy of the hospital. Again, and I discussed the issue with Dr. Sami Shawan this week, and he promised me that a new uh, schedule for the senior residents, as well as for the retina fellows, um, uh, they will send them weekly to King Fahad Medical City to do screening for retinopathy of prematurity patients. It is a very good thing for, for the residents of for retina um, uh, fellows because there are no fresh cases of ROP uh, at, K at Kekish because it's not a general uh, hospital. About the Kekish fellowship uh, programs, we have glaucoma, anterior segment, oculoplastic, pediatric, and retina medical or surgical, all of them for two years, except for uveitis, it's for one year. The total number of fellows are 45, which I believe is too large. We have 20 second year fellows and 25 first year uh, fellows. Our channel is almost the same as the residents, um, the teaching and the surgical exposure. 
Uh, for the teaching, uh, Dr. Sami Shawan again, he added a new teaching session uh, for the fellows, which is discussion uh, for, of each division in the last couple of months. It should be every Tuesday uh, afternoon uh, before the grand rounds uh, fixed in the majority of divisions. It's very beneficial for the fellows, and we are looking um, that it will be fixed in all of the uh, divisions. The second, uh, this is the table of the um, uh, sessions. It's always on Tuesday uh, afternoon, almost all of the divisions. Uh, the second issue uh, is the surgical exposure. Um, I, I believe the number of cases uh, should be much more considering that the fellowship is for two years, not only for one year. But what are the reasons? Uh, the number of fellows, this is number one. Each fellow is um, uh, covering only one consultant, and sometimes two or more fellows are covering one consultant plus the residence. So the team will be a consultant with one or two fellows with one or two uh, residents. This will decrease the uh, surgical exposure for the whole team, for the fellows and for the residents. So I believe that either the, uh, the uh, staff should be increased or the number of fellows should be lowered. Number two is the one-eyed policy. At KKH, there is a policy saying that any one-eyed patient should be done by the consultant, not by the resident, not by the fellow, even under direct supervision of the consultant. Uh, I believe that uh, this should be uh, um, judged by the uh, consultant. He knows when to give the fellow the case, and he knows when not to give the fellow the case. And as you know, uh, um, Kekish is a uh, tertiary center, so many of the patients are one-eyed uh, patients. The third issue is most of the senior fellow independent sessions are clinics. Only one extra OR session, which is half day uh, per month given to the um, senior residents. For us senior, uh, senior fellows, I mean, for us senior fellows, the second part of the second year, they give us independent sessions. If they give us like four sessions per month, three sessions will be clinics and only one session uh, will be surgery half day. So in general, fellows are having two to three surgical sessions, which are two to three half days weekly. Um, they do one to two cases uh, per uh, session. So now we have the assessment. This is something new going to be applied soon. Um, for the residents and for the fellows on the uh, website, uh, which is online, uh, for example, this is my account. We can see on the right down, there's the assessment form. Uh, you can put anything. You can put the research project, the community awareness, the uh, conferences you've attended, uh, self-evaluation, the lectures you presented, and your surgical logbook. So everything will be documented, everything for surgeries, lectures, conferences, and we can see in, in the up uh, right the uh, 360 evaluation as uh, mentioned in the last uh, talk. Uh, this is going to be applied uh, soon for all of the residents and all of the uh, fellows, and everything is going to be uh, online. So in summary, most of the residents and fellows are complaining mostly about the surgical exposure. Um, actually, the surgical exposure for the, for the residents and for the fellows is good. Uh, but we, we, uh, we're looking for something a bit, we're looking for something ideal. Knowing that there is an area for improvement in this uh, particular issue, so if you see the uh, fellowship schedule, you can say that 70% of it is clinic or clinical duties, and 30% plus minus is um, surgery or surgical part. I believe that it should be 50-50 at least, or more for the surgical part, because this is a fellowship. This is the peak of the surgical exposure for the um, physician. Thank you. You know, for the Americans here, it's all very familiar, right, Richard, the, the same problems. What I'm happy about is to hear how many of them are being addressed already. Sammy Shawan, unfortunately, is not able to be here today, but these are recurring problems, and the important thing is to bring them up, as has been done, have a mechanism to address them, and bring satisfaction. Thank you for a very nice talk. Is, is the last talk uh, loaded? Oh, there we go. All right, Dr. Suleiman. Thank you. This is our last talk, and then we'll have some discussion. Look forward to that.
Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm presenting on behalf of Dr. Sam Shahwan, the director of uh, Fellowship and Residency Training Program at KCash. So actually, Dr. Darab uh, touched on many of the points that uh, I'm, go I I'm going to present. So the Saudi Commission uh, uh, for Health Specialties uh, was established in 1992. Um, and it is involved in supervising and evaluating training programs, uh, setting controls and standards for the practice uh, of health professions. Uh, it also aims to improve a professional performance, develop and encourage skills and enrich scientific theory and practice in uh, the different health-related fields. Uh, it is located in the diplomatic quarter and, and it has several branches across the kingdom. So the residency program started in 1983. Uh, the first one was in the Mam region. Then in 1984, uh, the Riyadh program started. Uh, in 1997, uh, Jeddah program started. And uh, in 2015, a, uh, an expansion occurred in Riyadh programs. It, uh, the, the program was divided into three programs. Uh, KCash program, King Saud University uh, program, and the joint program between other hospitals. Uh, in 2016, um, two additional programs were created, the Asir program and the Medina program. And now there, there is a plan to expand more to cover uh, most of the kingdom. This is the first batch of graduates. Uh, we have seen them yesterday. Uh, the total number of graduates is 324 uh, to 2018. Um, the selection criteria, um, uh, the candidates apply, uh, submit their applications through uh, the Saudi, Count, uh, Saudi Commission website. Um, the, their applications undergo a matching process uh, and they are selected for interviews uh, for the five programs. The process usually starts in January and the results are uh, released uh, in May. So, uh, you can, as you can see here, the uh, GBA accounts for 30% of the selection. Uh, Saudi license exam score accounts for 50% and 20% is the CV of the candidate. So there are points that the candidate could collect uh, in his CV, and this includes uh, research activities. Um, if he has a uh, diploma following his uh, med uh, medical degree, um, and also if he is on the dean's list, um, ad in addition to a full-time job, uh, volunteer, uh, volunteering work also accounts for uh, some points and uh, if he shows strong interest in the, uh, in the field. Uh, the number of accepted residents in different programs uh, is uh, 34 uh, residents per year. Uh, in Riyadh, Kekish program accepts nine residents, KSU, uh, six residents. Uh, joint program B, uh, seven residents, Dammam program, seven residents, five residents in Jeddah, and the new programs except two and three residents. So the, the curriculum of the uh, Saudi board uh, was last revised in 2014, 14, and it is uh, um, uh, can med curriculum. Um, these are the approved centers for uh, res for residency. Uh, usually, they ro the residents rotate. Uh, they take. They start with basic science course, two months. Then, they have a total of seven months rotation in emergency room, uh, five months rotation in general ophthalmology, four months in oculoplast in your ophthalmology. Uh, eight months in an anterior segment, retina and uveitis, uh, they rotate for six months, five months in glaucoma, and five months in beads, and they have elective rotation for two months. Uh, 
the assessment uh, of the first year residents uh, include uh, promotion MCQ exam 50% and they have a written exam that follows their basic science course that accounts for 20%. Uh, they also uh, have a 15% monthly evaluation and the quizzes that they take over the year. The same thing applies for the second and third year residents, but uh, um, the oral examination uh, has more marks than these years. In the fourth year, the, the difference is that uh, they have uh, to do a thesis, mandatory thesis, and this accounts for 20% of their total score, and the oral examination accounts for 50%. All candidates that must achieve uh, at least 60% score in the continuous assessment and 50% in each category. Um, the formal teaching uh, and learning activities um, include core specialty, to specialty topics that will be delivered as basic science course and uh, specialty topics every week. Um, and there are universal topics. The practice-based uh, learning uh, include, morning, uh, round, include morning report case presentations, morbidity and mortality review, review journal club, case presentation, grand rounds, guest speakers. Um, of course, the work-based learning and the daily rounds, on-call, uh, clinics and workshops and courses in addition to tutorials. What is the KKESH role in, in all this? KKESH is a uh, Saudi uh, Commission uh, for Health Specialties accredited. Also, it is ACGMEI accredited. The total, this is the total academic activities at KKESH for real programs. Um, it hosts like, as you can see, 200 hours in the basic sciences and, uh, and other activities, including wet lab. Um, this is the total number of hours uh, in 2016 and 2017, 405, and 2017, 2018, 500. These are the research projects uh, by residents, and the total number in the last two years was uh, 91. Um, also, KKESH hosts residents from other uh, programs um, in emergency room rotations and in elective rotations. Um, the, in the last year, I think 80 residents were uh, enrolled in KKESH, uh, different uh, uh, specialties. The wet lab at Kekesh is uh, open for all residents, all comers. Uh, they can come at any time to uh, work in the wet lab. Um, and there is the international collaboration for elective rotations. The residents have two months of elective rotation and um, they can um, select which uh, with the area of deficiency that they, they, are, they want to work more on, in addition to if they are interested in a subspecialty, they can do more. Um, the community service and the residency program, um, Kekesh residents formed a, an outreach program called the Riyadh Ophthalmology Residency Community Awareness Program, and the leadership of Dr. Adi Rafir in 2016. Uh, the mission of this uh, community service is to uh, promote awareness, uh, educate individuals uh, using many services provided by residency program. Um, they also uh, aim to engage in prevention and intervention uh, to increase awareness about eye diseases and positively influence our community. Uh, nine uh, campaigns were uh, made, uh, were carried out last uh, year, from, from for last one and a half years, uh, with the participation of uh, 15 fellows, 82 residents, and 128 uh, interns. So the Young Ophthalmologist Group uh, was, uh, has initiated by the, has been initiated by the Kekish Residency Program. Um, and it is registered 
and accepted by the Saudi Ophthalmology Society. The main aim of this group is to guide residents and their training, provide educational programs, workshops, arrange uh, social volunteers and professional development to each level of training. That's it, thank you. I'd like to ask our speakers to please come up and uh, take a seat. Uh, maybe Dr. Aldarab, you could stand here at the podium with me since we only have five seats, so you'll share the podium with me since we have two microphones. Uh, while people are coming, I'd like to comment that there, it was a wonderful session and I thank all of the talks. My feeling overall is that the answer is uh, captured in the, this term reflection or feedback. That it, if we're not thinking about what we're doing, thinking about what we're experiencing, how our processes are working, we don't really have a chance of fixing anything. So we identify the problem and then we can discuss it, hopefully in a very constructive way, and come to a consensus answer. Uh, we're gonna get into some of the specifics, but overview for me, that was my takeaway from an excellent session. Are there questions from the audience? I'd like to entertain any that have come to mind. Uh, if not, yes, please. I, I oh, have a question. good. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for a wonderful session. Um, I, I really appreciate the inputs of, of all of you on this question. I, I'm sure um, uh, the professional um, part of um, of, the t uh, of of dealing with with uh, with our patients and our our colleagues is something that uh, that's in the mind of all of us. Uh, I, w I do have some question. I, I, I would ask Dr. Uh, Palace about it if she, if she could uh, comment on this. Uh, we face in our practice the issue of uh, having uh, patients uh, giving gifts. Uh, and this is an issue that, uh, that hasn't been uh, clearly uh, solved in, in many of the discussions that, that has happened, especially here that we don't have very clear uh, uh, guidelines about this. So, I would like to know your experience with, the, with, the, with such uh, incidents. Uh, That's an interesting one. Somebody want to take, uh, Anna? So um, receiving gifts from patients can be seen as a way of uh, accepting the fact that I'm going to be better with this patient because he's giving me a gift. So depending on the context, it may be acceptable or not. If he's giving you a gift after a successful surgery because he's very grateful, I think it's okay. If he's giving you the gift before surgery because he's expecting you to be a better surgeon, surgeon with him, that's not acceptable. So many, many professionalism issues are contextual. So it depends on when and, uh, uh, and, and in which context this happens. Some are definitely non-professional. I mean, Stealing on a patient, you know that it's not okay. But there are some gray aspects of professionalism that depending on the context and on the situation will be acceptable or not. Richard? I would, <clears throat> I would agree with that. Uh, also, it depends on the type of gift. For instance, uh, some patients may offer uh, money as, as a gift. And in that situation, uh, I don't think it's appropriate to, to take money, I often suggest to uh, donate the money to a foundation uh, to support either research or to support a fund for patients who can't afford care. So in that situation, I try to direct the gift in, in that manner. Did you want to say something on yes. water? As Gabby said, it, also, it all depends on the culture. In, at least in, in, in our country, this kind of gifts they give us, is, uh, sometimes they bring food or drinks or something that is acceptable and, and we take it and it's not seen as unprofessional, but probably if you get a bottle of here of alcohol, that would be unprofessional. <laughs> Maybe we can ask the, our, our Saudi colleagues, is there a policy at KCash about whether gifts are acceptable and what type of gift and when? I'm not aware of policy, but uh, it is left to the judgment of the physician. Uh, physician. Uh, so th this is something that is different in, in, 
culture here, if you don't take the gift, it may be received as an offense. You offended the patient like, by not taking it. Um, especially if sometimes you mentioned money. Uh, some people give money because they, they, they are paying you for your service uh, and they cannot do it otherwise. You are in a governmental hospital and I'm talking about a different level of patients. No, if Doctor, Dr. Abdizrachi knows about anything any further, policy. Dr. Al Alderab. No. You know about any policy. Okay. Oh, the policy. Okay, there's the official word. <laughs> <laughs> the CEO has spoken. Gifts are not acceptable. Okay, the official policy. How about dates? I, I, yeah, yeah. We I'm used going, to get <laughs> the official <laughs> policy of the of the, the the country is not to accept gifts. Of right. any kind. That's the official policy. However, we tend to overlook uh, gifts of the kind of dates, uh, flowers, uh, chocolates, because they are simple signs of recognition and appreciation. Yeah. And patients will feel very offended when you give it, give it back to them or refuse to take it. Expensive gifts are in general uh, not accepted at all. Uh, patients, some of them get quite offended if you don't take it. Uh, some of our staff, when they are, uh, when the patient is insisting, they take them and they give them to the social de department, ah. social services department, so they can then use it in any other way. But officially, gifts are not accepted. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I took the microphone. Yes. Uh, just to say, oh. I took the microphone. Okay, and then maybe we can give a microphone over here next, please. Well, I, have a <coughs> I have a comment. Uh, uh, and a question to Dr. Darab. Now, uh, I'm not sure if combining uh, residency and fellowship together under one department is uh, something that is worldwide acceptable. So I would like to hear from the comments of uh, our um, guest speakers from all over the world. I see the, the, the um, problems that are uh, associated with um, residency is totally different from that of the fellows. So combining residency and fellowship under the head of uh, one department and under the, um, under the direction of one person, I think that's a huge, huge burden. Although I'm sure Dr. Shahwan is doing a great job looking at the, the changes that he has made. I'm not sure, um, I'd like to hear from uh, our um, international um, uh, speakers. And the other thing is that um, you are a senior fellow and uh, you've been through the first year, now you're the second. What, is, what are the, the steps that um, fellows are being assessed, assessed at the end of the year or at the end of their fellowship? How are they assessed? Uh, do they take an exam or is it, um, how, how are they really assessed? Because this is not clear maybe to some of us. Thank you. Okay, um, unfortunately, Dr. Shalwan is not here to answer, but maybe the international guests do you have the same director for residency and fellowship, or do you believe it's important to separate those? Uh, we have, we have, this, Speaking we have the same one. It's you have, a, you it's, have it's it a combined. director for education, so he's in charge of everything, so, okay. but then we have different people So you're not charge. seeing any conflict with that? Mm -hmm. I think Dr. Dara brought up an, an important conflict is if you have too many fellows, then this starts to detract from the residency, and I think that's an issue you know, you can argue whether it's better to have it combined or separated for that reason, but it's an, it, he brought up, the, I think, one of the very important issue in the he, States as well. Yes, uh, I think Dr. Sami Shawan uh, started with the residency, and he did a really great job with the residency. And just recently, last, uh, last year, he, uh, he's now the director of the fellowship and for, uh, uh, for the residency. Uh, I believe that uh, maybe now he can be only for the fellowship because the residency now is m uh, much more improved than before. So I think the, e the job will be easy for the next one, for the residency. But the fellowship still, he has many uh, plans to do for the fellowship. So I think he may be stick to the fellowship and the residency can be uh, held by uh, another uh, position. And for, for Dr. Hamidan, um, for us, the fellows, we have an oral exam at the end of the first year uh, and at the uh, end of the second year, we have a written exam and an oral exam. And you cannot pass 
the first year unless you pass the oral exam, plus the um, uh, monthly evaluation and the research, uh, you should uh, pass all of them. You should pass the research mark, you should pass the uh, monthly evaluation uh, marks, and you should pass the uh, oral exam. This is again applied to the second year. The same is there. For the first year, uh, we, we have the minor uh, project. We have two researches during the fellowship. We have a minor research and we have a major research. The minor research including a case report or case series. The major research is a major research, like original article. The minor re research should be done and uh, submitted during uh, the first year. Um, if it's not submitted, you will lose uh, all of the research uh, marks and this may lead to uh, a failure of the first year and the repetition of the first year. This is applied again to the uh, second year for the major, which is the uh, original article. Uh, this is how we, uh, we assist in the uh, fellowship. Dr. Eduardo? I think it's a good idea to have one head of education because if he, that's too much work, he can, give, can get assistance. The problem with residents and fellows is that many times they compete between themselves for the surgeries. Yes. And the least you want is also the head of those areas also competing between them. So you need someone to look uh, over their interests of all those having training in your uh, area, in your uh, hospital. So having one head is, I think it's a good idea. And if it's too much work, he can have assistance. I have a question. Okay. Uh, how many fellows do you have? How many? How many fellows? Yeah. Uh, the, currently six. Six fellows. Six and fellows. Nine residents. All the all these uh, divisions. Yeah. One yes. one per specialty. Yes. We, we only take the number of people we can train properly. Many times. You, you, if you take too many people, you can't train them properly. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, th this is my point. We have like 45 fellows and around maybe 30 plus residents. I think it's very difficult for one person to, to uh, assist all of them. That, this is the reason. If it's like, like you, like the total is 15, nine fellows and uh, six residents or the opposite, it's somehow uh, easier. But if it's like 70, it's too much for, for one person. Yeah. You, you, can have, you can have both with one like sub-director of education, but you have to, you need someone uh, overseeing both groups. That's what Eduardo was mm. pointing out. Right? One thing I'd like to ask Dr. Abdulaziz, uh, he mentioned that the residents don't have a chance to do routine cataracts because KCASH doesn't have a lot of routine cataract. And I'm wondering now, as you're spreading out to other hospitals in the kingdom and affiliating, do you think there's a chance that some of those more routine cases can be done by residents who rotate in those other hospitals. Here, here's a mic. We change the, the, uh, the criteria or we introduce the system where routine cases are seen in the screening clinic and from there are the identified as uh, cases that are good for residents straightforward. They are referred to the comprehensive clinics, the general clinics, and that's where the residents pick up the cases and do them. So that was before we've already solved that. Okay. And in the future, hopefully within the coming few months, we will start introducing rotations of the residents in general hospitals, secondary hospitals, mm -hmm. where they will be seeing more of these uh, straightforward cases, plus cases with medical and systemic diseases that are affecting the eyes directly because most of the cases that come to us are filtered, yeah. especially the surgical ones. Clinical, we see all of them, but surgically, those that are not fit medically usually don't come to us. And there are some diseases where, you know, you, you need to practice and see more of them, and these probably will have rotations in uh, secondary hospitals. Do you want to comment on the other issue of how many fellows are right, uh, the right number when you have a certain give, given number of residents? What, what's your feeling about balance? You mean the number of fellows versus residents? Yes. Well, the, the, the numbers that we have are approved by the uh, Commission, South Commission of Health Specialties, and they are based on the number of consultants we have. So in, for every consultant, we have a fellow and a resident rotating okay. with him at the same time. That, to me, is, is not a bad combination if they know how to manage the cases well and, 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 and work collaboratively in a way or another. The problem is 
The country needs a lot of specialists in ophthalmology. And the numbers that we are graduating every year is a very small number compared to the need. Right. So we have to accelerate the system, not compromising the quality. And by the way, this is a huge, big debate that has been going on for the past three years. When the um, fellowship, when the residency program was split into three programs, there was a huge debate within the ophthalmic community whether we should do that or not. And at that time, we had only 12 residents in Riyadh program. <coughs> now we have like 40 something or 30, no, 30, 20, 23, I think, or 24. Mm -hmm. So it has almost doubled because we, it was switched into three programs. The country has a big need. We have to increase the number of people who are qualified. And the, the applicants' numbers are, are increasing. And we have to find a, somewhere in between where we balance this without compromising the quality. But I think one consultant with a fellow and a resident is, is, is a fair thing. Thank you. Yes, please. Can you take a microphone? Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Duker, and thank you for the organizing committee for the invitation. Um, I had the privilege of uh, being a resident at KCASH and then a fellow at KCASH, and then a program director at the joint program at that era. And I face some of these uh, difficulty that we are talking about uh, this afternoon. I'm now working in the university, for, so my, my uh, comments will not be as biased and will not be looked as bad. I think the, uh, the move of having one person to deal with the fellow and the resident is something considered to be, uh, need to be considered. Uh, as you mentioned, they will be under the same umbrella and then there will, no, there will be no conflict between these uh, two important wings of the medical education. Uh, if they are too much, they can be a deputy for each, but they need to be under the same umbrella so they can plan the medical education from the residency and end up with the uh, graduating the fellow. I think this, this needs to be uh, taken in consideration and it will be t uh, tried for the coming two or three years and then it can be reassessed. Exactly. Um, I was just going to uh, say, yeah. we need to be reflective. As I said, yeah. look at it again. The question has been raised validly. It's been discussed. Yeah. Let's see what happens, how it works out. It can always be changed. My, my question to Dr. Abbott, if you allow me to uh, ask, for the uh, registry that you are talking about, uh, do you need to have the same um, electronic medical uh, record, uh, the same program to have this registry, or you can, you can sort of uh, engaged in this registry with, with different uh, electronic health system? Yeah. <clears throat> the, uh, the way the registry is set up uh, through the academy, right now we're working with about 50, 50 different companies. So you do not have to have the same electronic health record. As long as the, the basic component of the record is available so that the software from the registry can extract the data points from your program. So each of the companies make sure they're compliant with the registry. This data can then be removed. So you can use many different programs. And so if a new company wants to come into the market, they just make sure they're compliant with the AAO registry. And that will be done electronically. You, can, you, you don't need to have the human factor to uh, input the data. I mean, my patient, if I want them to be in that registry, just connected and it will be integrated with the main system and that's it. Yeah, the system does it automatically. You don't do, any, you don't do anything. You go home at, in the evening and at night, all the data is uploaded. It's uh, compliant. All the privacy is protected. You own your own data, so you can see your own data and see how you are performing your outcomes compared to other physicians, either in your hospital or in your region, in your country. Um, but then all of the data is then, uh, so that nobody can be identified, and you can then see the general trends of what is happening to care in a particular area, like in cataract surgery or glaucoma surgery, and you can answer then a lot of questions. Could I ask you to please pass the microphone down? The, uh, oh, Hassan, I will get to you, but I, I've been waiting patiently. Uh, you're next. Uh, thank you. We'll come uh, back have, to uh, uh, Hassan. I comment on uh, 
the gifts when and one of uh, I think uh, Eduardo he said also the culture should be taken into a, a consideration I remember I was uh, supervising residents in Hyle in Hyle city up north and then after doing a cataract surgery for one old man he was insisting that inviting us to his home uh, a week to saying okay okay we are not, I was we were not uh, planning to go to him in fact but then uh, after the third week his son came to me in the clinic he said doc I would like you I want you in the uh, in the parking lot I said what I said come with me and then when <laughs> I went with him there was a live sheep in the in his car he oh. said this is from my <laughs> my father uh, to you and you should take it we cannot uh, uh, we, uh, we cannot uh, uh, agree for uh, we cannot accept any uh, compromisation so uh, I think the culture where you live is very important uh, some of them they will feel that uh, refusing a gift is an insult to him now my uh, point in uh, from uh, uh, training what about because I was in when I was in the university insisting that we should have a slot one or two um, uh, trainee per year for from uh, outside the country Gulf area or uh, Arab or even any uh, from uh, uh, international as well to join our program uh, uh, so that this will uh, add to the program and also when you uh, when this uh, uh, you mean sending the residents here to their countries, they will, yeah, yes they, okay uh, I mean reserving one or two positions for uh, international candidates. I'm, I'm sure that would be welcomed by them, but maybe the needs right now are so great that you need to take care of training Saudis first, right? Uh, sure, of course. To add for uh, uh, cataract yes. surgery, here in the program we have starting with the wet lab and simulator to start with. Then they have chance to work in the comprehensive uh, clinic, which is already contracting the uh, straightforward cataract for the resident. This is designed for that. In addition to that, in the last two years we added the uh, sending the resident outside the country to do cataract, intensive cataract surgeries, as they do in the state to send it to the, uh, India. So I think so the cataract uh, issues is being solved in the program, and there is no competition directly now with the fellows or resident in that issue. Good. Yeah, I mean, doc, Dr. Darab said that the, the numbers had gone up double or even yeah. triple, so I think that's I, I totally agree confirmed. with Dr. Adibi. Dr. Um, Abdelaziz, maybe yeah. just make final, final comments yeah, because okay. we're... Uh, on, the, on the point of why the uh, residency training program office was uh, joined with the fellowship training office is a logistical reason, actually, and a strategic decision. When we went into uh, restructuring of, the, uh, of King Khalda Specialist Hospital and we changed the organizational structure, we looked at those two departments and we saw that there was sometimes a lot of conflict between the two and a lot of competition between the two and a lot of bickering between the two because they're fighting for space, for education, for so many things yep. and there was lots of communication between the two departments. So sometimes some fellow, we have applications for fellowship and uh, when we look at them and sometimes accept some of them, we discover that during the residency they had a very bad reputation in terms of being serious, coming on time, he had several other actions taken, disciplinary action taken, which the fellowship department did not know about. Plus, they also used the same uh, areas, let's say. There are lots of common areas logistically and administratively. The staff are doing almost the same thing. They're preparing evaluations from the resident to the consultant, from the consultant to the resident. They have to follow, uh, to follow this every month. They have to send reports out, statistics. They have to do schedules. It's the same thing. So having two offices with the secretarial support and administrative support doing exactly the same thing, we thought it would be a duplication. And it would be much better because sometimes when you ask help, they say, oh, I'm in charge of residency. Uh, the fellowship is not my business. Mm -hmm. So we thought of combining the administrative office and support in one, which is used to do the exactly the same thing. You have all the education department under one, one umbrella. So all the educational mm -hmm. facilities, the wet lab, the uh, the uh, 
classes that we do from visiting professors to the resident and fellows are always under one umbrella. And then this way we can also monitor the progress of the trainee from, the, from his first year in residency until he finishes his fellowship. And this is where, identi we, where we would identify potential future leaders. We will keep a very close eye on the first year residents and try to pick on those that we think have leadership qualities, whether on the clinical side or the administrative side, and nurture them from the beginning and mentor them until they finish their fellowship and then they, we, we will pick them handpick them to join Kekesh. So this was the reason that we did all of this. And at the end of the day, you will have one person who is in charge of both sections, and therefore he will give his attention to both of them. And none of them will get priority. In the beginning, for example, the wet lab was part of the residence. So the residents were always favored, and the fellows are always out, because this is not for fellows, this is for residents. Now it's under both. So they have a schedule now where it's equally distributed. If the workload is too much for one person, definitely Dr. Sleinan actually assists Dr. Shahwan on many of these activities. And this was done on a trial basis for a year, a year and a half, with the aim that when we revise again the organizational structure, which we're going to do in a few months, and make some changes, then we will look at this and see whether this was a successful move or we have to revert back to the Absolutely. Thank you for that. I think we need to stop now. I'm sorry, there's still questions. But those who still have questions, please ask the uh, speakers individually, because I feel like the, the audience has been very patient and waiting for their coffee break. So please take a break and come back on time for the next session on res research activities. Thank you. An announcement, please, for everyone. I'd just like to remind you again, after the opening sessions, all the sessions are relaxed informal. So please, you don't need to wear, come fully dressed. Come in your t-shirts, in your jeans, in a cap, come comfortable. One, two, you're all invited to dinner tonight. Dinner will be at 8 o'clock. It will be at the compound of KKH at the football field. If all, any of you, if they don't know, please ask the staff. You have to come in with your badge. Your badge is enough for doctors. And we'll see you at 8 o'clock for dinner. Thank you. Said where is it?